Okay, welcome back everybody. This is CSIS 3020, Web Programming and Design. This is week six, second video lecture. So we are looking into the DOM. And you know now the power that we have with the DOM. Now let's figure out all the different events that you can manipulate or that you can count on with JavaScript. And that's what the next chapter is all about. So basically you're capturing events as you can see. Something so simple as clicking this inline registration model into traditional registration model. So let's take a look at the code. You have two divs, right? One is called the inline and the other one is called the traditional. Now, the inline has an unclick, while the traditional doesn't have any. You guys see that? The unclick on the first one will take you to handle event, which is this uh, JavaScript function that all it does is alerts you the event was successfully handled. That's all. You know, you're supposed to put something in there that executes uh, some JavaScript code. But notice one thing. This div, although it didn't have an onclick, it also answered the same way as the one that it did the unclick, that did have the unclick. How do you do that? Well, again, the body has an unload. And what are you telling it to execute when you unload? Register handler. And register handler is a JavaScript function that what it does is the following. It tells, hey document, get me an element called traditional. So now we're getting this div. And we're putting it here, in this variable. And then what do we do? We just say, hey traditional, I want to give you an onclick function. So right there you're setting the onclick for that div, which initially didn't have, like the inline. And what are you assigning to onclick? You're assigning handler event. But wait a minute, what is handler event? It's a function. Wow. So now we're going back to, wait a minute, in JavaScript, not only you can manipulate strings, integers, and objects, you can also pass them as parameters. In fact, you can pass a whole piece of code like you would with any object, like you would do, we would do with any string. You can pass a whole piece of code around as a parameter, as a value assigned to a property, okay? That's the power of JavaScript. And the only reason we can do that is because, again, and I keep repeating this every week, JavaScript is typeless, okay? So you can manipulate primitive values like an integer or a string, or you can manipulate objects, whole objects, a whole line item, or an image tag, and you can manipulate also code. Now, when you load this page, and you take a look at the actual code, Notice one thing. You do see the unclick of this div. 
because it's part of the code. But you do not see the unclick of this one. And at this point, at this point, this diff also has an unclick because we're past the onload. And you will get 50 points more for next ho next week's homework if you tell me why. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, but this section I cannot make it bigger. Sort of a that. Remember? <laughs> Remember JavaScript code. JavaScript code. What is JavaScript code for a browser? It's a comment. It's a comment. When it's about to render the page, look what it sees. Remember, we, we have to put this. Otherwise, you guys will get errors when you have JavaScript code inside the HTML page. You guys see that? Every single example that I've shown you shows the JavaScript as a comment. So between this starting comment, remember that you guys should already know this. This is how you put comments in HTML. Left bracket, exclamation point, dash, dash. Everything that follows will be a comment. And it will keep being a comment until you hit the dash, dash, close tag, which is right here. I'm sorry? Mm -hmm. The problem is it will try to execute it. Let me see. That might have changed with the latest versions of the yeah, of the browsers. So in this case, yeah, it took it. Well, at least it didn't barf on it. Yeah, it did take it. But anyway, if you take a look at the source code of this page, notice that this div has the unclick. But this div doesn't. And it's already loaded. Right? Which means if it's already already loaded, we already register the handler. And what is register the handler? Putting under the traditional div, putting an unclick. But it doesn't show in the code, so where is it? So those are the f those those will be the fifty that will be the worth the fifty points if you can answer that. <laughs> because at the end of the day Regardless of what div I click on, they respond the same way. Look, I'm clicking on the inline. There goes the event. This is the JavaScript. Yeah, because I put it in the header. I'm sorry? Yes, this one, if I click on this one, which didn't have an unclick, exactly. Yeah, that's what I'm doing here, remember? Traditional dot unclick assign handler, handle event, and handle event is a function, which is the same function that this guy has on the unclick. All right. So I'll be waiting for an email from any one of you telling me why it didn't, doesn't show up in here.
50 points more. Both of these supposed to sh are supposed to show in unclick. Say it again. Both of them have an ID. One is called inline, the other one is called traditional. Alright, let's move on. How do you do that? And I think I can make it bigger this time. Yep. This is something I should put on my kid's um, browser. Spend time viewing this page so far. 25, 26. Okay? So how do you do that? Remember set interval? The one that resizes the image. Scheduling. On the onload, you say, hey, start timer. And start timer is nothing else than Windows. Set the interval of update time every second. Or 1,000 uh, milliseconds. And so every second is going to run update time. And what is update time? Well, you start, you increment a variable that you started at zero, global variable. You increment it. And all you do is, you say, hey, document, get me an element, because I'm about to put this information in the page. So I need to grab a tag somewhere where I can put it. So I say, okay, document, get me an element called so far. And so far is this strong tag. Right? And then as part of the inner HTML, inner HTML, inner HTML is a property of any tag. And it's going to be the HTML that you put between the beginning and end of that tag. Got it? So you're going to get strong, which is the tag called so far. And you're going to replace the inner HTML that with that number of seconds. And you're going to, it's going to be doing it every second. Okay. Any questions? Let's keep on going. Events. Hold control to draw blue. Hold shift to draw red. You can get really creative with JavaScript. I've seen really cool games, I mean games, complete games, written in JavaScript. <coughs> How do you do that? All you have is a table called Canvas, right? pretty much can see where the table is, right? And it has a table heading that says hold control to draw, so this is the table heading. Okay. And that's it. But on the onload, you create the canvas. And what is create the canvas? Say, so, okay, I'm going to get the element called table body, and table body is this guy, is the actual table body, the body of the table. This. 
okay and you put it here then notice what you do you start creating a whole bunch of elements inside in fact you create 200 columns by 200 rows so each one of these each one of these points it's a table data in the table okay notice there's four two four loops from 0 to side which is 200 from 0 to side this is I and this is J and all you're doing is in this case you're creating a new table row and in this case you're creating a new table data so you're creating 200 table data next row 200 table data next row and you create 200 table rows so you're creating a grid of 200 by 200 okay now this is where the event part comes into place for each one of those table data, which we called a cell, you're going to create an on mouse move event. Remember, we have on click, we have on load, we have all these. Now we have one called the on mouse move. And what are you going to assign as a value to the on mouse move event? you're going to assign this function the process mouse move function and we're going to see in a few seconds what that what that does because you're passing the actual code if I do this you are assigning to on mouse move the result of executing process mouse move with parameter e if you assign this you're not assigning the result of executing process mouse move you are actually passing the code got it so you're actually passing to on mouse move this whole thing. That's the power of JavaScript. And it could also be the real mess of JavaScript. And then what do you do? You take that cell and you append it as a child of the row, obviously. Remember, you're creating a whole bunch of TRs and a whole bunch of TDs in here. You have to let them know that they're related, that the T, this TD belongs to that TR. And as you keep creating TDs, you got to put them inside that TR. That's how you do it. Row, append child, cell. Cell is the new TD, and row is the parent TR and so you do this look at this look at this it's a lot of TDs each one of them have the on mouse move whatever each one of those has the on mouse move I'm sorry? Here they are. Oh, right. Which is, you know, again, the same question, yes, which you, you will get 50 points if you answer that correctly. <laughs> Not really. So look at this. Some of them have a style background color red. 
See that? So the ones that are in red, this one in particular, which I can't really see which one it is here, has the background color red. And that's what the process mouse move should accomplish. Okay? So when the on mouse move, which means I'm moving my mouse over it, it will trigger that call. Okay? When I'm moving my mouse over it, <coughs> I'm going to be passing a parameter. The parameter E is the event parameter. Okay? First of all, I ask has any parameter been passed? If it's not passed, then I'm going to get it out of the window. The window parameter, excuse me. So, if no event is being passed, that's what if not E means. If no event is being passed, I'm going to get the event out of the window. So, I'll say, hey, window, give me the event that just passed. Okay? Now, I'm going to ask, at this point, I know that there's an event. I'm going to ask whether the event was the control key or the shift key. If it was the control key, then what am I going to do with the background color style of the current table data? I'm going to change it to blue. If, on the other hand, it's not a control key but it's a shift key, then I'm going to change it to red. The background color of the style of the current table data. And that's what this means. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the concept of this. If you've seen Java code or have you taken any of the Java courses, this refers to the current class object that you're in. Okay, so in this case, this refers to whoever is executing right this minute process mouse move, which we know that all of them are these cells, which we know that they are table data. Okay, so this refers to the current table data that I'm in. So that's why nothing happens, nothing happens when I mouse over each one of the table data unless I hit the control key or the shift key. Got it? Now suppose that we wanted to have one color by default. So I'm going to have blue by default. So I'm going to get rid of that if statement. I'm going to refresh the page. And now, without hitting any key, I'm coloring blue. But if I hit the shift key and keep moving it, now it's red. Now it's blue. Now it's red. See that? Questions. I need you to please grab these concepts. If you didn't understand anything, don't worry, I'll repeat it. But I need you to understand what's going on here. Any questions? Now, if you want to, guys want to find out a little bit more about our mouse events and whatever, if you go to W3Schools, for instance, 
and you go and search for the unmouse move here it is on mouse move event occurs when the mouse pointer is moved so if it's moved on top of an image it will trigger the on mouse move of that image if it's moved on top of a TD table data it will trigger the on mouse move of that table data doesn't really matter what tag what really matters is that it occurs when the mouse pointer is moved on top of that tag Okay. These are the supported HTML tags that support on mouse move. And look at this. It's pretty much all the HTML tags. Anchor, image, table data, strong, small, table headers, table rows, buttons. Okay, so you get the point. Next, um, this is very similar, and I'm not going to cover it. This basically shows me the colors in hexadecimal. You know, red, green, and blue equivalent hexadecimal. And when I hover over them, they change to their color and their name. So when I go inside, it changes to their color. When I go outside, it changes to their name. See that? It's what, well, how are you accomplishing that? It's, it's its own... On mouse over and on mouse out. So on mouse over, you do something on mouse out. On mouse out is when the pointer leaves that tag. So you get the point. Next. How about this one? And this is something that I suggest you start doing because you're going to be doing it on your registration page. In fact, you will be doing it on every page where you ask information from the user. Like, I don't know what I have to put here. As soon as I go inside name, I get some help. Enter your name in this input box. Then I tap to the next, and then there's some help. but you can do that. That's a really good point. In fact, when you go inside the email box, you should get help of what you're expecting. When you leave the email box, that's when you should validate. If there's a problem with the email address being input, you should either show some message in here. Don't use pop-ups. Pop-ups are annoying. Okay? You should use some kind of uh, in red or some noticeable color some show an error message in here and I should still be in the email box and that's all controllable through JavaScript so just to go very quickly on that how is that accomplished you have an array it's called a help array with all these messages okay into your name, into your email, blah blah blah, right? And then all you do in each one of these is unfocus another event. Unfocus. Unfocus is when that tag has the user focus. Okay? You're about to enter information into it. It has the focus. And on blur, you're about to leave the focus of that tag. On blur. So on focus of this first one, you display help text zero. And on blur, you display help text six. So what is help text? Help text is a function that you pass a message number 
and all you do is the following. Hey document, get me an element that I know it's called tip. So somewhere in here there's gotta be a tip. Here it is. It's a div. Right? So we say, okay, document, get me an element called tip. And then I'm gonna put inside tip inner HTML. I'm gonna put from the array that message. Which that index. That is. That is it. So when you do unfocus of the name box, you will be displaying enter your name in this input box, which is message of zero. When you leave on blur, you will be displaying six, which is what? Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Nothing. So on focus, you display the message. On blur, you get rid of the help. On focus, you display the help for that. On blur, you get rid of the help. Got it? similar stuff. Alright. So you get you get the with events, right? Events. Pretty much all the on whatever are events of the tags. Okay? And like I said, on W3 schools, if you do a search on all the events, it will give you the whole list of possible events. In fact, if you go into Eclipse and you do, you know, the name of the whatever tag dot, it will pop up in IntelliSense drop-down box with all the on whatever events that you can do for that specific tag. All right, no questions? Any questions? So far, the last six weeks, we've been covering a language, a markup language for hypertext. Okay? This language has provided us the ability to render content. Now it's time to go into another language. It's also a markup language, but it's extensible markup language. And the idea is not for rendering. It's to represent data. So XML was created to be able to represent in plain text, represent data. Okay. So this doesn't have to do anything with rendering content, which is what HTML was. So extensible markup language. If you and I were to define what a player looked like in XML, this will be it. First of all, every XML file must start with this sentence. That's the open bracket question mark XML, which means here comes an XML, and then you specify optionally the version. Okay? Question mark, close bracket. In fact, XHTML, which are the samples that we've been seeing so far, also start with that tag. What does that mean? It means here comes an HTML page which will contain HTML tags but it's well formed. The same well formed as an XML file. And you're gonna see that XML it's much more strict in the syntax and how you construct it than HTML. HTML is very for forgiven. If you don't have a matching closing tag, that's fine. You will keep try the browser will keep trying rendering your page, however, but XML mm -mm. it will stop right there and say, I'm sorry, but I cannot do anything with this XML. So that's one of the first things that you gotta um know about XML. It's very strict. What does that mean? For every opening tag, there's got to be a matching closing tag. Okay? 
So in this case, player is the root, the top tag in my XML, in my player XML. And what does it say? It says that player consists of three things, a first name, a last name, and a batting average. The actual values of those, you will put them inside what is called the inner HTML, right? Remember the inner HTML? You will put it inside between the open tag and the closing tag. That's fine. That's one of the many ways that we can represent a player, right? Now the problem is, if I were asked to represent a player, I will probably, instead of putting player, I will probably put baseball player. And instead of first name and last name, I will probably put just name. So the way that I can define a player in XML could be different than the way that you define it. So that means we, we could probably end up with 20 different versions of how to represent player in XML. That constitutes a mess. Okay? Especially when you think that XML is being used between systems from totally different platforms so they can communicate to each other. In fact, that's one of the things that XML came about. So that we could actually make two systems totally disparate from each other on totally different technologies and be able to communicate. Okay? So if that's what we're aiming at, then what we have to do is let me show you another example. This is another example of an XML. Right? This is how I will represent an article. An article cons uh, is consists of a title, a date, an author, and an author contains within itself first name, last name, right? So you can go as deep as you want. Sort of what you did with the DOM, the document object model, you can go as deep as you want with the XML. But anyway, so if we were to determine, if you were to sit down, you and I sit down and determine what a letter should look like, Okay, we will come up with what it's called a data dictionary. And as you can see, this XML, which is trying to represent a letter, has a reference to a letter DTD. Okay? And this one, the letter DTD, is the actual data dictionary. The data dictionary is nothing else than metadata of the data. Okay? And any of you have seen compilers? Usually in computer science or computer information systems there's a, a course called compilers. And compilers is what will let you compile text into binary code. Right? This is what you would do when you want to define a programming language. This is what it's called a grammar. This is the grammar of a letter. How do you read this? There is an element called letter. And letter consists of the following parts. One or more, that's what the plus means, one or more context, a salutation, one or more paragraphs, a closing and a signature. That's what a letter is. What is a contact? A contact is another element that consists of the following name, address 1, address 2, CD, state, zip, phone, and flag. Now, contact contains an attribute list. In fact, this attribute list is very short. It's only one attribute. What's the name of the attribute? Type. And it's going to be any alphanumeric data. Okay? Now, what is name? Name is another element that 
It doesn't consist of anything except any alphanumeric value. And that's what the PC data and the data stand for. So address 1 is alphanumeric, address 2 alphanumeric, and you get the point. Now notice this one, flag. Flag is another element. A flag doesn't have any values. Notice that it doesn't consist of the PC data. In fact, flag is empty. Flag will not have any content between the beginning and end of the flag. But flag has an attribute called gender. And gender could be either M or F. And it will be M by default. See how I'm reading this? So, once you and I decide what our letter should look like, then you and I can create a data dictionary so that your letter and my letter will be the same, at least the way that we define it. And here is the perfect example. Letter. Letter is the root tag. Remember, that's the root element of the XML. It has one or more contacts. In fact, it has two in this case. With type, different types. This one is sender and this one is receiver. Contact contains name, address, etc., etc. And it contains a flag. Notice that flag doesn't have any content. And this is how you write an XML, I mean, an H as, as same as in HTML, remember? When you want to put the tag, the open and closing tags into one, this is how you do it. You specify the name of the tag, and then you just put the front slash closing tag. And that's in itself uh, an open and closing a matching closing tag. Okay? So in this case, since flag is empty because it doesn't contain any content, we put it as a um, as a opening ending tag in one, and then we just specify the gender, which is one of the attributes, and the gender is female. Okay? Then we have one or more paragraphs. We have a salutation. We have a closing, and we have a signature. <coughs> now, when my system wants to com communicate with your system and exchange letters, what we have to do is we have to send each other the DTD, the data dictionary, so that you know what you have to conform by, and we all agree on it. The problem is, when you start getting into really a lot of users, and this user modifies a little bit the DTD and doesn't notify the other users, it pretty much becomes a mess pretty soon. Okay. In fact, every time that the letter DTD, the data dictionary, gets changed, all the uh, elements involved in using the letter will have to be notified. And that becomes a nightmare. So, that's why namespaces were created. What is a namespace? A namespace is a place in the internet where we put that DTD and put it in only one place. You want to conform to it, you want to create an XML that conforms to it, you just reference that namespace in your XML. This is the perfect example. We have a namespace called text, and you could call it whatever, Peter, Paul, whatever, and an XML namespace called image. And this is where you will find the specs, the DTD for that namespace. So in this case, you will go into a URL or a URNN for a universal resource and notation. It's title, you know, it could be any company, whatever. And then the actual specification, the DTD for that. So whenever you find in the XML a tag that conforms to the Ditel text info DTD, you will have to prefix it with the text name. So, text file, text description, 
text file, text description, all conform to this DTD. And then the same thing with this one. Image file, image description, conform to this DTD. So notice that we're doing, now what we're doing is, we can have a file and a description of the file that conform to a specific namespace, which will be a totally different meaning to the same tags, file and description of another namespace. You get it? Okay. So how do we use... Oh, by the way, when you do not specify a prefix to the XML namespace, that will be the namespace used by default. So in this case, notice that we don't specify the column file anymore. I'm sorry, the column text anymore. And therefore, this one, which doesn't have a namespace, will default to that namespace, the text info. Get it? Just for default. So this one and this one are the same. But in here, we specifically said this tag will conform to the text namespace. In here, we're saying this file doesn't have a namespace. Therefore, it defaults to this namespace. <coughs> Correct. By putting the namespace, you do not have to include anymore the DTD, which is what? Which is the data dictionary that, ta that is the metadata that tells you what it should be formatted as. Now, how do you define the DTD for the letter? Oh, we already did that, right? Where is it? Okay, so now, the way that we define the data dictionary for a namespace has its own language. It's not that grammar that I show you guys. Now it's called an XSD. An XSD stands for schema. It's a schema definition. So this is how you and I and everybody that wants to be able to define what books or what letter or what player should look like, we will all sit down create an XSD, a schema definition of what that involves, and we will publish it. And everybody that wants to communicate between each other, so they refer to the same player, so they refer to the same letter, so they refer to the same books, should comply to that schema. In fact, the way that you define a schema should comply with a schema published by the W3C the, the World Wide Web Consortium organization. And in fact, that's what it's, we're doing here. Notice that when we define the schema for books, we are conforming to a much global, much more global schema that is being published by the w3.org website. Okay? Now, this schema, the target namespace, that's where everybody will go to when they will want to comply to this books schema. The target namespace is the actual URL where the schema will be published so that anybody that wants to conform to this books schema will find it. Okay? And the XML namespace being used in this schema is called DITO. So that's the prefix. That's the prefix being used. So, in a very similar fashion as we did with the grammar, how would you read this? This is how I would read it. There is an element called books. Right? 
and its type is it's a data which means conforms to this name schema and it's a books type what is a books type a books type it's a complex type that has a sequence of elements in fact it only has one element the element is called book and now the fact that it has a sequence means it could have one or more book all right element book which its type is a single book type from the title schema it has a minimum of occurrence of one and it has a maximum of occurrence of unbound which means unlimited so what is a single book type a single book type is another complex type which has a sequence which means you can have more than one of the element title and the element title is a string just by reading this schema how do you think the XML will look like what do we have as the root books what do we have as the children book 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 what do we have inside a book title this is the XML that conforms to the title books namespace notice that we put in there the namespace with a prefix right this is it and then you say it's going to be the title books the title books and typically you will put this namespace at the XML level not right now you're putting it at the root level that's fine it's the only namespace you use but you see this book 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 and each one has a title title so that's the whole idea about namespaces now namespaces can get really complicated in fact they can actually specify ranges of values and what's acceptable and what is not acceptable this is a perfect example the element laptop we're about to define what a laptop should be as far as the specs of the laptop a laptop is a portable from the computer namespace right and this computer namespace is what Dytel believes a computer should be okay the compu the laptop is a portable and a portable is made out of all the following elements element one is processor monitor CPU speed and RAM processor is a CPU according to Dito computer namespace so what is a CPU a CPU is a simple content with a string extension of an attribute and what's the name of the attribute a model so basically what you're saying a CPU contains a name of the CPU and the model what about CPU speed CPU speed it's what it's called a, gi a gigahertz under the Dito computer namespace what is a gigahertz a gigahertz has a restriction it has to be decimal in fact there's a value to it there's a minimum inclusive value of 2.1 you cannot put anything below that this will be an example of a laptop XML that conforms to that got it
Now, I'll typically name spaces, and I'm going to take a I'm going to take a look at this namespace. It's a w3.org namespace. Okay, if you see w3.org, you know that it's serious. In fact, many industries that are in the same kind of business, they have gotten together and they have proposed a recommendation to the W3C organization so that they can share the same information and talk about the same data in their own business, in their own fields. Okay? So if we take a look, for instance, at this W3Org math, MathML, What is this? It's a namespace XML recommendation with the following namespace it should be. It should be the URL. And these are all the different recommendations that have been put in place in the last, I don't know, 1998 to 2010, the last 12 years. So math XML as a namespace, the definition of what a math XML namespace is has gone through 12 years of history through three different versions, four different versions. And just as you see this, a namespace that went through recommendations through W3C org until it gets approved and it becomes a standard, many other technologies and namespaces have gone through HTML is one of them. HTML never started at 5 or 4, whatever the latest is. It went through several phases uh, and versions. And they were all recommended to the W3, um, W3C organization until they get approved and then they become a standard. Okay? Any questions? Yes. Correct. Because we want, what's the whole objective? Remember, share what? Data across the www. World Wide Web. You want to be able to share data using XML across World Wide Web? You have to have a namespace that have gone through several phases of recommendation, approval, standardization. Now, if it's between you and me, yes, we can come, you know, we can decide, and, and we don't have to go all the way to a namespace, because a namespace. Require it's it's much more robust than a DTD. If it's just you and you and me, we can get together a document, a DTD document, and share it. Like I said, when more and more people started sharing the same DTD, then somebody modified that DTD, then the whole population that was using it had to be notified about it, and it became a mess. That's why schemas came into place. Yes. That's another that's another <sighs> Remember you're trying to exchange encrypted data in XML. No. In fact, the technology is already there. You can have web services. Web services exchange XML. You can have web services with pieces of the XML encrypted. And there's already a technology of where to find the keys, how to exchange the keys, how to change everything. <coughs> Those are all standards. If you go into um, web services, I can't remember it right now.
now what's the there's a whole bunch of acronyms that defines each one of those technologies and how they deal with encrypting information through XML but again they all went through the same as the math XML math math, math ML is just one of the few examples that I can give you but there's tons of examples of technologies they have to go through all this um, recommendation approval standardization process okay so <coughs> now we're going to start looking at the interesting part about XML remember the whole idea is to be able to oops sorry I want to see this in notepad We want to be able to take XML data and take HTML and put them together so that we can render in a nice user-friendly way HTML data that comes from XML. Right? That's the whole idea. I mean, it doesn't have to be coming from XML it's just XML is one of the many data sources available. What other data sources do you know? A database? A database is another data source. You can have really nice HTML pages that get constructed, get rendered out of data from a database. In fact, that's what you guys are going to be doing the next eight weeks. Okay, we're going to have a MySQL database with your data, and you guys are going to pull data out of that database, and you're going to render it the same way that you rendered your static web pages. Okay? Alright, but right now we're dealing with XML. So this is a way that we could, in a very limited way, explain what sports are. Right? So sports are made of games, some ID, the name of the game, and a small paragraph about the game. Right? Now, we want to be able to take that XML. Notice that nowhere in here, look at it, nowhere in here I'm saying this is an HTML and it should be rendered as a table or anything like that, right? However, when I type that XML and open it with Firefox. Look what I get. How did that happen? You will think the browser knows, right? I'm going to take player and I'm going to open it with Firefox. This is what Firefox should have done with sports XML. It should have given me the actual tags of a player. And I can expand or contract each one of this. Right? But that's not what it did with sports. Look what it did with sports. It actually put a table, it put a background color. Where's all that coming from? No. It's what it's called an XML style sheet. And that's what is going to allow us to combine XML with HTML. XSL style sheet. Notice that it has the um, 
namespace called XSL, right? And if you guys go into that namespace, you will see that it's one of the oldest. Wow, this is the 1999. In fact, you have to be authenticated. Okay. So I guess I cannot go in there. Password required. It's restricted. Anyway, so that namespace defines what an Excel XSL should look like. XSL style sheet. Okay. And notice that we have HTML inside it. See that? This is plain HTML, right? Well, sort of. Once in a while, in there, inside the HTML, you will see tags that are prefixed with the XSL, which means these tags will conform to the XSL namespace. They're not HTML tags anymore. These are HTML tags. Right? So you guys get... Are you guys start? Am I confusing you or are you starting... Are you guys starting to get the jinx of it? This is another namespace. Okay. <laughs> this is the namespace what defines what an extensible hypertext markup language should look like. XHTML for short. This is the namespace that defines what an HTML page should look like in a well formed way, in an XML way. That's why it's called XHTML. Okay, and that's what we're creating here. Inside here, we're creating an HTML page. But guess what? This HTML page does not have just HTML tags. It has an XSL tag, which XHTML doesn't understand how to render. But it doesn't matter. We have here a namespace and knows how to treat that XSL tag. In fact, you can find that in the XSL transform from 1999 W3 uh, recommendation. I'm sorry? Oh, yeah. If you show sports So how did I get this HTML out of that XML through the XSLT XSLT's XML style sheet transformation basically what XML style transformation basically what you're doing is you're taking an XML file and transforming in it into an HTML. Okay? That's what you're doing. And it's all inside an XSL page. And the XSL page has to conform to this namespace. That's all it is. So up to this point, you should understand it. This is just HTML, right? What do we have in the HTML? We have a header. Inside the header, we have a title. We have a body. We have a table. We have all this stuff. But hold on a second. Hold on a second. We also have an XSL tag, which HTML doesn't know how to render. 
but this XSL tag conforms to this namespace. So it knows how to render it. It knows how to manipulate it. And what do we have here? We have a tag call for each. This is a for loop. Guys, look at this. This is how you do a for loop using XML. For each what? You have an attribute called select. What are you selecting? You're selecting root sports game. Wait a minute. So let's go back to the sports XML. Sports XML, this is something that we very quickly jumped. We skipped. There's an XML style sheet associated to this XML. And what's the name of this style sheet? Sports XSL. That's the guy in charge of transforming this XML into HTML. And notice what's the root? Sports. What comes after sports? Game. That's what you're doing here. For each element called game under the sports root, you're going to do the following. You're going to create a new table row and you're going to create a new table data. And the table data will contain what? Here comes another XSL tag. It contains the value of ID. The value of name. The value of paragraph. So you better find inside the XML an ID. A name. And a paragraph. So you see what's going on here? For every game tag under sports root in the XML, I will create a new table row. And the table row will contain, as the first table data, will contain the value, the attribute value called ID. That's what the at stands for. At means there's a value that comes from the attribute. So this game will have an attribute called ID. And I want you to put the value of that right here. Right there. And then next, under game, you will find a name. And I want you to put the value of that in here. because name is not an attribute of game. ID is an attribute of game. Name is a child of game. For each is a function, correct. It's a for loop. Where is it defined, right? Here, in this namespace. Exactly. The World Wide Web Consortium right now has the 1999 schema definition of an Excel transformation. Correct. Correct. What you want to do is you want to use that link to verify whether indeed this document conforms to that schema. No, because I can I can disconnect to my my network and it will still uh, the XSL transformation should still work. I mean I'm sorry? Do I need to be connected to the internet so that this works? Because you 
I'm sorry? Well, the browser already knows that transformation schema. So you don't really need to be connected. But if you were to if you were to find if you were to find the need to verify that this document conforms to that, yes, you will need to be able to connect to that schema so that it it verifies that it's well constructed. I'm sorry? If you don't have this line you will not know how to confirm to it. You want to save it? And you want to be able to open it? At this point might be cached. I have no idea where my namespace. I'm sorry? If I get rid of what? Hold on, hold on. Get rid of what? This whole thing? Well, then when you find an XSL here. Oh, you want me to put empty string here? Line 6, column 1. I have no idea what you're referring to. Line 6, column 1. This XSL style sheet doesn't have a namespace. I don't know how to conform to it. I don't know what an XSL column is. Right? As soon as you as soon as it sees that column and it has something prefixed, it knows that it's some specific domain. In fact, it's it's a namespace of its own. Right? So it's going to try to look how to conform to it. But you don't have a namespace that says you should conform to this. So it will just, you know. And if you put one that is not existing or that the browser doesn't know about, same thing. I mean, I will have to create a web server with my namespace.org domain where I publish the XSL namespace. So I will publish the the XSD. Right? But why going through that if or you can have a local host that has its own right. That's that's the development the developer way of thinking, yes. <coughs> yes, you were thinking I don't get your question. XSL is a namespace. No, that's a good point. Notice, am I using XSL here? Where do you see XSL being referenced? Yeah, but this is the name of a file. Sports.xsl. That's the name of the file that is going to transform this XML. But nowhere in here. Oh, I see what you're saying. The fact that it's text.xsl. That's that's how he knows how to transform it. Yes. That's how the browser will know how to transform it. Okay. But it doesn't stop there because, like, if you notice here, if you define a namespace that doesn't exist. 
the browser wouldn't know how to render even though you specify here in the XML that it was an XSL. So, what is really important about this document with these XSL tags is that they conform to this namespace. That's how the browser knows what a for each means. That's how the browser knows what a value of means. Otherwise, it, it wouldn't know what to do. I mean, value off is not an HTML tag. Right? So this whole XSL file, this whole XSL file, which conforms to this namespace, is made out of what? What's the root of this file? It's a style sheet. Okay? And the style sheet has an output and a template. You guys see this? It has an output and a template. Now the output tells it, you know, it's going to be HTML, that the document type is going to be, you know, this DTD, the XSHTML1 strict DTD, and all that stuff. That's going to be the output. But the template, the, plem the, the actual XSL template, tells me, hey, you got to be able to go through this XML and match the root. That's what this means. Match the root. Once you match the root, in this case, what's the root? Sports. Once you match the root, you can render all this HTML. Got it? Sort of. So this is an example of a transformation where you get, you can actually sort stuff. Look at this. I am defining a book. This is the ISBN. This is the title. This is the, uh, these are the authors, or you can have more than one. These are the chapters. Notice that I have them in any order. Right? Chapter number, whatever, pages, whatever, title. And I want to be able to render it so that it shows like an index. You know, in, in certain order. In ascending order of the of the uh, so what do you do in the template you say I got the matched book I got to match the book here it is book is the root once I match the book then I'm gonna be doing this whole HTML section see that And wherever you want to grab information of the XML, you just say, I need the value of, and then relative to the root, you just specify what kind of value you want to put in there. So if the root is book, and you want to put the first name, what do you do? You say, go from the root into author. Inside author, you will find a first name. And it will grab that value and put it in here. Okay? Now, the really neat thing about this is that it has an XSL sort tag. 
just by you saying, hey, whatever you put in here between this beginning and ending, I want you to sort it. And it will sort it out. In fact, you can tell it what to sort it by. I want you to sort it by the attribute number. And whether you want it ascending or descending. And by doing that, this XML, notice this XML, look how it can be rendered. I don't know why it's having problems with an apostrophe. Let's save it for a second like this. Nope, doesn't like it. as you guys remember what's the ampersand is it amp I think it's amp right so you open it with Firefox here it is that is that XML render in HTML with the chapter sorted Sorry? Yeah, but you know what's the problem with databases? You can't give access to everybody in your database. Can you? No. With an XML, you just hand it in and exchange it. Right. Okay. All right, but you have uh okay, I'm going to give you another example. You have an Oracle database on one system. And you have um I don't know, a DB2 or a Postgre database on another system. And you want to be able to communicate between the two. You think the Oracle is going to be able to communicate with the Postgre and the Postgre is going to be able to communicate with the Oracle? Seamlessly. Unless you create some middleware that allow them to communicate between the two, you won't be able to. With XML, you can. Because XML is plain text. First of all, XML is plain text. Right? So machine knows how to interpret plain text. Second of all, this XML conforms to a schema. A schema that you and I have gone together and abide by it. End of the story. That's the whole purpose of XML. To be able to exchange data regardless of the type of technology platform that your system is in. Okay? Alright, so I'll let you guys read chapter, the rest of the chapter 14, and, um, why? <laughs>